Good morning, and we welcome you once again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this regular worship service coming to you from the Potchefstroom Methodist Church. Today is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and our prayer is that as we prepare for Easter, you will share our excitement for the celebrations coming up of this most important event in Christian and world history. I'm Lo Hayes, a member of the ministry team, and it is my privilege to serve and wash you with a word this morning. And may you be blessed and enriched by our worship service. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather before you again this morning. We praise your holy name for your grace and your mercy. And in this Lenten period, we want to glorify you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to this world to take our sin upon him and to bring salvation to all who would believe in him. Thank you, loving Father, that your word reveals to us a simple truth, that sin entered this world through human folly, Yet sin, which holds us tight within its grips, cannot resist a heart that is touched by your grace through Jesus Christ and cannot contend with the living water of your Holy Spirit pouring into our hearts and our souls. Your word reveals to us a simple truth, that sin has been defeated and that we can become the people we were always meant to be by your grace through Jesus Christ. Your love which breathed this world into being, established a covenant people of whom we are part, brought them out of captivity and into a promised land. Your love, from which even before our birth, has known and called us by name, from out of this world's slavery to sin into your kingdom of salvation. Your love, may Jesus endure the nails of our sin, but he defeated death and rose again and caused our hearts to sing and rejoice. Sovereign Lord, your hand has touched the dry bones of our faith and your word has breathed new life where there was death in our lives. Thank you, gracious Father, that your Holy Spirit raised us up from where we lay and your love has brought us home and to your cross. And by your grace we stand forgiven and free. Remind us often, Lord, when we are feeling proud, arrogant, beyond reproach, pleased with ourselves and self-sufficient in our own eyes, that Jesus walked a road that took him to a cruel cross and rose again to show us where we will find rescue and salvation and that we will become humble before you. Jesus, Lamb of God, when you walked this earth, you did not consider heavenly equality though that was yours to choose. But you took the role of a servant, and in humility and in obedience allowed the rough nails of our sin to be hammered into your flesh for the sake of our salvation. And so it is that we acknowledge you this morning as Lord of all, today and forever, to the glory of God the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, in your mercy, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And hear us as we also now pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our hymn this morning is that very well-known one, hymn 161 in the Methodist hymnal, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. It was written by Catherine or Kate Hankey. Her full names were Arabella Catherine Hankey lived between 1834 and 1911, and she was an English missionary and a nurse best known for being the author of the poem of 100 verses called The Old, Old Story. And from this, the hymns Tell Me the Old, Old Story and I Love to Tell the Story were derived. And I read the, the words and note the love of Jesus that is depicted in there. 
and then at the end we will listen to the hymnal. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory and of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to a little child, for I am weak and weary and helpless and defiled. Then the chorus, tell me the old, old story, tell me the old, old story, tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in, that wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget so soon. The early dew of morning has passed away at noon. Tell me the story softly, with earnest tones and grave. Remember I'm a sinner whom Jesus came to save. Tell me the story always, if you would really be in any time of trouble, a comforter to me. Tell me the same old story when you have cause to fear that this world's empty glory is costing me too dear. Yes, and when that world's glory is dawning on my soul, tell me the old, old story. Christ Jesus makes the whole. We listen to them. Our scripture verses this morning come out of the Old Testament and the well-known Psalm 95. And I'm going to read from verse 1 to 9. It is a call to worship, but it is also a glorification of who our Lord is and why we should actually worship Him. And that will be underpinned and underlying what we are talking about this morning. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord, and let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains, are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. So today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Messiah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to test and put me to proof, though they had seen my work. And then our New Testament scripture comes from 1 John 3, verse 1 to 6. And we sing that song, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us. And that is where this comes from. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not been made known. But we know that when Jesus Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. But everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. And no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. And no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. May the Lord bless the reading of a scripture to our hearts. I've entitled what I'd like to share with you today. And the main theme is going to be worship and our common worship overall. And my title is Love Expressed Through Worship. Now, last week, Friday, during our weekly communion service, Reverend Edward Brown gave a short outline of John 12, 
this one to seven, which is about the Bethany family. He had recently just raised Lazarus from the death, and he was reclining there to have a meal with them. And then Mary, totally against the custom, took her head covering off, sat down at Jesus' feet, poured the very expensive spite and hard oil onto his feet, and wiped his feet with the oil, with the, her hair. And I thought this would be a very good introduction to our message today, as these actions by Mary speak of absolute gratitude, of sacrifice and of love and of worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as today is the fifth uh, Sunday of Lent, and we are less than two weeks away from Easter, I saw it fitting for us to look at the concept of worship in our daily lives, not just worship during our worship services on a Sunday, but how we should live during every hour of our lives. And I do hope in line with the spirit of Lent that you had spent some time reflecting on and preparing yourself for this most important period in the Christian and world history. And apart from meditating on the Easter events and their meaning to us, it is also a time to consider our own worship, not just in such events, but also our worship in our daily lives. So let's look at some as aspects of what true worship is and what part and place worship should take in our Christian lives. We will also look at the fact that worship is an action verb and a commitment and how our love for God and others can be practically expressed through living lives of worship. Now if during the message I stir you up a little bit or even make you mad, that's fine. We all need to be stretched a bit at times. But let's just look at some definitions of what worship is. A short definition of Christian worship could be the act of attributing a reverent devotion, honor and homage to God. The Greek word that is used for that in general in the New Testament is proskuneo, which effectually, effectively has quite a number of meanings but it is to prostrate oneself in homage and worship. Now we are all worshipping creatures by nature, and every day, everywhere we go, we worship, and it is what we are and what we were created for. We cannot help but worship, but this is the catch. We worship something, and that something is the key. And Louis Giglio, whom I mentioned previously, offers this definition that worship is our response to what we value most. And if we value God's grace and mercy most, we'll be motivated to give him our very lives. Jesus in John 1 verse 20, uh, 4 verse 23 and 24 further says that the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. But why do we need to worship God? Now, if you can remember a month ago, I spoke about the splendor of the king. And today we also speak about the greatness of God. And that is what I believe is why we should worship him. 1 John 4 verse 9 says that we love God because he loved us first and sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. That very well-known scripture in John 3.16, we know what it says. God so loved the world and I'm not going to recite the whole thing. Two Sundays ago, Reverend Edward preached on sin, and among others, the reluctance of ministers to preach on sin because it could offend people and sometimes not be politically correct to call sin what it is. Yet, a fact that cannot be overlooked is that with the fall, it was sin that separated man from God and has been ever since, and that is why Christmas and Easter are so significant to us. Someone had to come and restore the relationship between God and man and point man back to what holy living is all about, which God intended from the beginning. And central to this is God's love. Now let's look at this uh, love of God. And I think we all are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, which is called the love for, uh, chapter. And what is read at so many occasions to define love in a secular way as well as a Christian way. 
But we need to think about these passages from their foundational point of departure, which is, love is not an out-of-the-blue emotion. Love is a choice, an act of the will, which has its very foundation in the very nature of God. So instead of just seeing love as God's command on how to act towards others, see it as God's unlimited expression of himself, and that it needs to be manifested through us, the love that was placed in our hearts, in all we do. You see, when God loves, we can know that his love is infinite, like all of his attributes. And this is an amazing thought, that God does not just love us, he loves us infinitely. Similarly, we can say that when he forgives, he forgives completely. And when he saves, he saves thoroughly. Jesus did not do a half-baked work on the cross. He fully died there for us. And with Jesus' blood, a new covenant was made. And when God makes a covenant, it is a forever covenant. The eternal, infinite God does not express his attitudes and his attributes in temporary or partial manner. No, he is an extreme God with an extreme love. And it is good for us to be constantly reminded of this love. And 1 Corinthians 13 gives us all the characteristics of God's love. And with it also, his essence of who and what he is. And when we look at God in this way, we can then better understand the kind of love that is the subject of our scripture verse in 1 John 3 verse 1, which says, Behold what manner of love has been lavished upon us. That kind of love God has lavished on us is unlimited. It is amazing and it is free. We can never exhaust it. That love is poured into our hearts by God's Holy Spirit the day we positively respond to God's call and accept His Son Jesus by faith and become His born-again children. And what is the outcome of that? John 1 verse 12 to 13 tells us, Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of a natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. Now, if that is not enough reason for us to bow down and worship our King, then I do not know what is. And all he wants us to do is to love and worship him in return and have an intimate relationship, an intimate personal relationship with him. Now, I mentioned earlier, what about our worship services? I think we need to approach our short times on a Sunday morning with an attitude of worship like David says in Psalm 122 verse 1. He said, And I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. And we need to ask ourselves why we come to worship services. Do we come to just attend or to participate in all the activities taking place during the service? Do we just come to enjoy the singing and the worshipping, or is it for the tea and the coffee and the fellowship afterwards, which we can't do nowadays? You see, worship is more than just coming to church on a Sunday morning. While that is part of it, worship actually is the essence of what makes us truly human. We were created to worship. We worship out of thanksgiving for the goodness of God for His grace and His mercy, and His provision in all areas of our lives and at all times. And I think the good example which I always quote is of true Christian worship can be seen in the very first church in Acts 2. Everything they did was in praise and honor and thanksgiving to God. Now during a recent uh, discussion on liturgy at the university, I thought to myself, now why can't a whole service be one of true worship? And again I turn to Louis Giglio who said in his little booklet, uh, The Essence of Worship, Most of my life I thought that you went to church to worship, but now I see that the better approach is to go worshipping to the church. So we don't go to church to worship, we go worshipping to the church. 
And if we get to church and we go through the whole liturgy, even from the welcoming, the notices and everything, is act, they are acts of worship. When we read the word, when we do the offering, which is a love offering, when we listen to the word, and when we sing our hymns and our songs that go with it, and even the benediction when we are sent out into this world. And John Wesley said, indeed, the extent to which we do not offer ourselves to God reflects the extent to which we do not understand the depth and the significance of God's mercy. After a worship service, the question should not be, did I like the music or the sermon today or did the service please me? No, the real question should be, was my worship both here and as I now go out into my little world again, was that pleasing to God? And this dedication should be both a duty and a delight. Because you see, as I said earlier, worship is a verb and our worship must lead to action. We cannot just be spectators here. A week has 168 hours and we spend an hour in church. What happens in those other 167 hours that are left. God's love in our hearts should prompt us to spread that love through our little worlds that we operate in every minute and every hour of the day. Now how is our worship services, uh, how they go, is extremely important. But God is just as concerned with how our service of worship goes outside our walls of our church into our day-to-day -day lives as Christians. And that is when we truly carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world that needs it so much. I close. Three things happen when we truly worship God. And that is when I speak about every day of the week, every hour of the day, every minute of that day. And the first thing is that it brings us into the presence of God. When we truly dedicate ourselves to the Lord, we read the word, we learn about him, we start getting to know him. And then as Proverbs says, the second thing that happens, it develops the fear of the Lord within us. And that fear is not that fear that he will kill us immediately or something like that. No, that is that worshipful reverence of God. And this is developed through that wonderful relationship that we can have with him. And then Proverbs also says it instills the wisdom of God in us so that we can take decisions in our daily lives based on the word which gives us the truth and the way. And I want to close with what I call God's altar call. See, now is a personal time for us to present our whole being as sacrifice to God. As we see Roman 12 says, Jesus did that on the cross for us. Embracing God does for us and is the best thing what we can do for him. So let our challenge and our decision for the remainder of Lent and our lives onwards be to take on an attitude of worship in everything we do. Let us endeavor to discover the greatness of God anew and recommit our lives to him in a personal relationship. Let us worship him in spirit and in truth in everything we do. It is then that we will discover that indescribable rejoicing in the Lord that Paul expresses in the doxology at the end of Romans 11, where Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond finding out. And then he finishes it off by saying, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And it is my prayer that our worship may be to his glory forever as well. Amen. We close our service and I ask you to receive the Pauline benediction as we find in 2 Corinthians 13. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.